Welcome to the second part of our heritage talk, Saved from Extinction, exploring how archaeology is saving our aviation heritage. In part two, we hear more about the finds. Now behind the engine on our wreck proved to be a large three-section cockpit, which indicated that the aircraft had a crew of three. Now, whilst the cockpit was much damaged and the perspex canopy that went over it was not in place, we could tell some things about it. Now, although the aircraft clearly had no forward firing guns, it's a bit of a clue in itself, and no machine guns were found, actually found on site, the magazines of a twin K gun were found scattered around the wreck. These 0.303 British machine guns were used in single or twin mounts. Here you can see a single K gun carried on the back of the cockpit of what I think is a British fairy battle. Oh, perhaps the most famous users of uh, the K guns uh, were the Long Range Desert Patrol Group, the uh, forerunners of the famous SAS. Here you can see a twin K gun mounted on one of their jeeps in the North African desert. K guns being aircraft guns, defensive guns, were designed to fire as rapidly as possible because you only got a short period of time in which to engage uh, an approaching fighter. And that game meant they had tremendous firepower, which was great for the SAS and their hit and run tactics. Now, although damaged, the cockpit contained other fascinating material. A uh, large radio was found, which you can see upper uh, center and upper right. And in this image, uh, where it can be seen newly recovered onto the dive barge by uh, one of the divers. A lovely artifact that. And this is interesting. This is a Morse key. And this is something you sat on. It's the bucket seat of, uh, I believe it was the pilot. I have to check that. But we also found seat fittings and uh, padding. Now to the right of the Perspex window you can see up here is something interesting, which uh, gave us another clue about the aircraft. Uh, by the way, the Perspex window um, was found under the aircraft, almost as though it had been popped out, and perhaps that's a, uh, another clue that I'll come back to later. Uh, but in the middle, top, is a shield or cover for a radar set used by an observer. Now, radar was a major advantage for any aircraft expected to locate targets in the wide expanse of the sea. So this was another very clear clue that this was a naval aircraft. Now, toilets are not, of course, a normal feature of small combat aircraft or really any combat aircraft in the Second World War. And uh, I direct your attention to the alternative down here, uh, which is a comfort bag also found in the cockpit. And this is a particularly nice find. It's the pilot's rubber oxygen mask. We also found some dangerous things because a tube-shaped holder uh, was found to uh, contain two smoke floats. Now, these contained phosphorus and were pyrotechnics that were dropped as markers in emergencies. And because it, they contained phosphorus, it meant that it was too dangerous to bring the floats to the surface because phosphorus ignites spontaneously in earth. And try as you might, you won't be able to extinguish it. So instead, they were removed and safely destroyed on the seabed by the UXO diver working uh, with us after being recorded. These are very nice 
These are large batteries also found in the cockpit, and they proved that the aircraft had a 24 volt supply. Now, remarkably, the batteries, when recovered to the surface, still proved to retain a very small charge. And equally remarkably, uh, fire extinguishers were also found that still appeared to be pressurized. This is a compass made in Liverpool, which was found in the rear of the fuselage. Now it was there because it was the master unit. And this needed to be away from large ferrous objects that could interfere with the compass readings. And as the engine was the main culprit, the compass was positioned as far from it as possible. The crew instead had access to a repeater in the cockpit. This comes from the right wing and is made of brass and it's a pitot tube and it was made in Taunton. And this was used to measure airspeed and the tube would be mounted as far out on the wing as possible to reduce the effect of turbulence on the readings. We also found bomb crutches, bomb mountings under both wings and the remains of a torpedo crutch under the fuselage, which clearly demonstrated the aircraft was a torpedo bomber as well as a dive bomber. Now, although I will probably not surprise you by saying that we'd pretty much satisfied ourselves at a fairly early stage what the aircraft was, all of this evidence and more pointed towards the fact that it could really be none other than one of these, a fleet air arm furry barracuda. Now, Britain was what we would perhaps these days call an early adopter when it came to operating aircraft from ships at sea. Indeed, we were very much pioneers in naval aviation. We launched our first aircraft from a ship in 1925. And in 1915 at Gallipoli, the Royal Air Service, or the, I should say the Royal Naval Air Service, carried out the first torpedo bomber attack. And in 1917, we carried out the first landing on a moving ship. And this is an early landing, I believe, on HMS Furious in 1917. You can see that this ship, converted into an aircraft carrier, didn't have a full length flight deck. Instead, if the pilot overshot, the hope was that this aircraft would be caught in the steel wire barrier in front of him and that he wouldn't be hurt or drowned if his aircraft instead fell off the side of the ship, which they were wont to do. Now, our naval avi aviators were very brave. They were certainly willing to risk their lives. And in my opinion, they were possibly even crazed men because they landed on postage stamp sized flight decks on often pitching and rolling ships with the near certainty of death if they got it badly wrong. In the interwar years following the First World War, our fleet air arm introduced uh, the arrested landings that I've talked about. It adopted catapults to launch some aircraft. It introduced the flush deck aircraft carriers that I was talking about. And yet, despite these technical advances, when we entered the war, our naval aircraft were pretty much second rate. Most were biplanes, such as the very slow, very swordfish. And the fleet air arms, only modern monoplanes, were the skewer and the rock made by Blackburn. Now, with a maximum speed of only 225 miles an hour, they compared very unfavorably with the 330 mile an hour plus that the RAF's Hurricanes and Spitfires could manage at the time. 
This was at least partly the result of the fact that although the fleet Euron had been formed in 1924, it was part of the Royal Air Force and it didn't come under the control of the Admiralty, i.e. the Navy, until 1939. Now the RAF's priority was understandably the defense of the British mainland and not its fleet. At a time when the aircraft carrier was taking over from the battleship as the decisive weapon at sea, Britain unfortunately entered the war with a fleet that was ill prepared for the challenges ahead. And catch up was required. Now, despite a slow beginning, the fleet air arm went from 225 carrier based aircraft at the start of the war to 59, yes, 59, not aircraft, but aircraft carriers at the end of it, with 1300 first line and 2,500 second-line aircraft. Now, whilst the Royal Navy relied very heavily on great American naval aircraft, such as the Wildcat, the Hellcat, the Corsair, and Avenger, to transform itself into the modern carrier strike force that came to dominate the seas during the war, new British aircraft introduced during that war also had a big impact. I'm thinking the Hawker Sea Hurricane, the Fairy Fulmer, the Supermarine Seafire, the Spitfire at Sea, the superb Hawker Sea Fury, perhaps one of the best um, piston engine fighters ever built, and the much derided Furry Barracuda. Now, the torpedo bombers that the Fleet Aeron started the war with were biplanes, the Albacore and the famous Swordfish made by the British company Furry Aviation, despite its obsolete design and performance. However, torpedoes dropped from Swordfish, jammed the Bismarck's rudder, ensuring its destruction, and did grievous damage to the Italian fleet at Taranto, helping to alter the balance of power in the Mediterranean. But they looked old fashioned and they were slow, achingly slow if it was you flying towards a heavily defended target. As is usual in the services, humour was the crew's response. And I've heard the following tale about an American and a British sailor talking about a furry swordfish. The American sailor says, gee, who makes them? The British sailor, furries. American sailor, that figures. Now skill and gallantry can only take you so far. What was needed was a new aircraft to replace these obsolete aircraft. The famous American Grumman Avenger was imported, but work had already started on a new homegrown replacement. And this was the Barracuda, or specification S2437, as it was imaginatively first known. And that specification called for a naval aircraft capable of being deployed from an aircraft carrier and therefore with folding wings or from an airfield able to fulfill the functions of a torpedo bomber, a dive bomber and a reconnaissance aircraft against the radar. The first prototype flew in 1940, the second in 41. There were delays in starting production and it wasn't until May 1942 that the Mark I version of the new aircraft entered service. The improved Mark II followed with a famous Merlin engine that equipped the Spitfire and the radar that allowed the aircraft to detect surface vessels. And over 1,700 were built by Ferry and their rivals such as Blackburn and Bolton Paul. More than 850 of the Mark III's with much more powerful Griffin engines followed them. And in January 1943, the first frontline squadron was equipped with these aircraft. Now, the Barracuda was certainly advanced on the Albacore and the Swordfish. It's a monoplane with a crew of three. It had a decent engine. It had the radar, it had carrier friendly folding wings, 
the Mark II version had a range of almost 640 miles, even when carrying a torpedo. However, it was certainly no looker, as you can see from this. It also lacked a forward firing gun. And despite the undoubted pedigree of its engines, it also lacked speed. And its engines also proved to be asthmatic in hot climates, which limited its impact and effectiveness when the British fleet transferred its efforts to the Pacific in the closing month of the, months of the war. Now, a cockpit sign on the aircraft that we recovered refers to assisted takeoff. This indicates that what no, were known as RATOX were being used, small rockets designed to assist takeoff and then fall away from the aircraft. Here's, uh, I think it's, uh, somebody's going to have forgotten what that is. Uh, it's taking off from carrier to fighter, it's taking off from a carrier, um, and you can see the two plumes of smoke that are spreading out in a, in a fan from the rockets. Um, if somebody could remind me what aircraft that is at the end, if you know, please. Is it a Sea Fury, Graham? You've got it. Yes, brilliant. Thank you very much. And we found three of them, although they were uh, um, uh, designed to fall away from the aircraft after takeoff, we found three of them in the vicinity of wreck. Of course, we can't prove, especially as we're close to uh, the runway at Leon Solent, that they are from our aircraft. Thank you for watching part two of our heritage talk, Saved from Extinction, exploring how archaeology is saving our aviation heritage.